<laughs> just trying to connect. Oh, you see. So, Amy, could you go? Yeah, so I think it's connecting now. Okay, that's fine. So, Amy, did you go through some videos on derivatives? Yeah. How do you find them? Uh, not that bad. Not um, bad. Using the power rule and everything makes things so much easier. So I don't yeah. have to go through the whole process Perfect. with the different quotient formula. Um, but still, I do use it just to check that it's all working and everything's the same and I'm actually getting like in the right. So I've been doing both alongside. You're doing just the right thing. So yes. Najib, can you hear us? So Najib, we cannot hear you, but we'll assume that you're able to see us and you're able to hear us. So we'll continue with our meeting. Uh, let me welcome you both, Emmy and Najib. Today, we are going to start our unit number three. In unit one, we discussed rate of change and all of the concepts which are very necessary uh, for us to understand derivatives. And in unit two, we actually took up uh, limits and we understood what gradients and limits, how they work in together, and how do we find rate of change at any point on the curve. And now in unit three, we'll discuss about derivatives. Right? Since you've done a lot of practice earlier on with rate of change and gradient type of questions, you shouldn't really find this particular unit difficult. And rather, you'll find it very interesting. And at times, I see students asking me questions, why was this not introduced to us early, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah. let me share with you the screen, and then uh, we'll see uh, why we did not share this with you. So I hope both Najib and Emmy, you can see my screen. Yeah. This is on the derivatives, right? Mm -hmm. Now, First lesson on derivatives, what we learn is this difference quotient equation which is given right on the top, right? So, see this difference quotient equation? Yeah. Dy, oh, okay. See so only the right side of this difference quotient equation which is so familiar with you. Perfect. Now, we have been calling this as the gradient equation. If you have to find gradient at any point on the curve, you could use this using a instead of x. So at that point, x will be equal to a. You could also use it as a gradient of the function because you know gradient is a function. Now, application of gradient is huge. Rate of change is something which we are trying to figure out in so many different applications, maybe chemistry, biology, physics, economics, anything, right? So rate of change is a very common term and therefore, we have a new name to it, and that name is derivatives. So derivatives is more or less the same thing as we were talking about, gradient. The only thing is, we'll have a different nomenclature here. We write derivative in two different forms. One is dy dx, and the other one is f dash x. So I'll just introduce you to both the forms in a minute. Uh, before that, let me tell you what we are going to talk about in today's session. We'll discuss the basic concept of derivatives, what is derivatives notation, differentiability, power rule, constant multiple rule, general power rule, sum and difference rule for derivatives, and we'll take up examples based on tangents and normals, and also one on rate of change. Now, ME for CG, GCSE course, this is one of the most important chapters on calculus. Half of your questions are based on this chapter, so you need to really understand it and practice, okay? Okay. Now, to begin with the concept itself, we know that the gradient g of x was defined as limit of a function f of x plus h minus f of x over h, where h is approaching zero. We got this expression by bringing the two points very, very close so that the slope of the secant line matches with that of the tangent line, right? And that is how we define a gradient. Now, the same definition applies to most of the rate of change questions, and it is so popular that we are giving it a different name, which is called derivative. And the symbol being used will be f prime x. We call this 
as a prime notation also for derivatives. But the expression on the right hand side is exactly the same as what we have been doing. Perfect. In case we want derivative at a particular point, then x is replaced by a. x equals to a represents that particular point. Correct? So derivative, as you can see here, is exactly the same as the gradient itself. Now let's talk about two very popular notations which you will find in most of the books. Now in one of the, there are two things which I like to mention here. First, we are saying derivative at a point and the second thing which we talk about is derivative in general for the function. So when I write a, that means we're talking about a point where x is equal to a. But if I don't write a, that means it is x. So we just treat it as a general derivative of the function itself. Now, one of these definitions, we use f prime x. Now this is called prime or Lagrange's notation. Okay, so these are the two names. For simplicity, we just call it a prime notation, but the scientist's name has been ordered, honored, and Lagrange's notation, it is very popularly known as. The other one is, we use dy dx, and this is called Leibniz notation. Strictly speaking, it is d dx of y, d dx of the function f of x, you understand? So d dx d over dx, we say d dx or we say dy dx. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. These are the two notations which we are going to use uh, in our discussions on derivatives. Right inside, again, is the same thing. Limit of f of a plus h minus f of a over h, where h approaches zero, right? It's very, very close to those two points are. Right, so with this, let's begin uh, and see how it works. Uh, I've taken one example to illustrate how, you know, we are bridging the gap between what we know about gradients and what we are going to do in derivatives. So in example number one, we're saying we'll find derivative of a function and gradient at a point. The question here is that we are given a function f of x equals to x cubed plus one. Now, to understand it better, I've also shown the graph of this particular function cubic function which has been moved one unit up. Okay. Mm -hmm. We need to find two things about it. First, derivative with respect to x, which we write as f prime x in our prime notation, right? Using first principle. So, so derivatives, basically, we need to find using the first principle. But once we learn some rules, then we'll apply the rules and straight away, applying the rules, we'll get the answer. Now, it is such an important concept, so it becomes necessary to work with the rules since first principle really takes a lot of time. And part B is to find the gradient of the curve at a particular point, and the point chosen here is P, which is 2, 9, shown here. Perfect. So first half of it is absolutely clear. To find the derivative at a point is same as to find the gradient at that particular point. Perfect. So to begin with, we'll find derivative of the function in general. So we are writing that we know that the function f of x is given to us. f of x plus h will be replaced x with x plus h in your expression. And so using the difference quotient formula, we'll just substitute the function itself in it. And x plus h whole cube is been expanded here. And then you simplify the terms. And what you get is all the terms in h, take h common and cancel with the denominator. You get a, an expression where you could substitute h equals to zero. And there you go. You get your derivative, which we were calling till now as a gradient, right? Or a rate of change or instantaneous rate of change at places. So f dash x is 3x squared. So that becomes the gradient of the curve now. We'll do part B, which is to find the gradient at a point P equals to 2, 9. X value is 2. So we'll replace X with 2, right? So we have replaced X with 2. See the notation, F prime of 2. Derivative at X equals to 2 is replace the X with 2, and you get 3 times 2 squared, which is 12. So the derivative at X equals to 2 
is 12. Is that clear to you? Yeah. Exactly same. The only thing which you have done is change the name from gradient or rate of change or instantaneous rate of change to derivative and the notation will be dy dx or f prime x. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to the notation, we have seen two different notations. One, we write dy dx and then we write f prime. However, dy dx is a very good notation to be used since you know both the variables we are talking about. X is the independent variable, Y is the dependent variable. Sometimes in an equation, you may have more than one variable. In that case, it makes sense to clearly write down what we are differentiating one with, right? But the variable in single variable calculus, which is our main objective at present, it doesn't make much difference. So for convenience, we use the prime notation rather than dy dx most of the time. But dy dx is a preferred notation. Sometimes we also use capital D or capital dx to represent derivative of a function, right? So we will be using that sometimes. Now, if you want to find derivative at a specific point, then you have to mention the x value of the point as mentioned here in the form of f prime a. Remember, gradient of a curve at any point is the value of the derivative at that point, correct? So when I say find the gradient at this point, it is you know, interpreted as instantaneous rate of change or slope at that point, which is the value of that derivative at that point. Now, since we have a derivative, it is not necessary that we'll always get a derivative of each and every function. There will be many circumstances where derivative cannot be found. It may not exist, mainly because the limit may not exist at that particular point for the slope of the tangent line. So these are a couple of examples which broadly gives you an idea. Where will the function have a derivative or will not have a derivative? So we actually discussed this earlier also while talking about the gradients. So as you know, if you have a cusp or a corner, as you have in absolute function or in radical or thirds, x to the power of two over three times, in that case, we are not sure about the slope of the tangent line as we move from left to right. There could be many different tangent lines at one particular point, and we say that does not exist. Now, in this square root function, here, if you try to figure out, it is like a vertical tangent line. That vertical tangent is also not defined. And therefore, we say the derivative does not exist. If you have a discontinuity, as shown in the last graph here, in that case also, at the point of discontinuity, we cannot have the derivative. One important thing here is, you can only find derivative on the domain of the function. If there is a point which is not in the domain, especially if you have an asymptote, for example, then we cannot have a derivative at that particular line, which is an asymptote, or we cannot have a derivative for any hole since it is not in the domain, right? So you cannot draw a tangent at that point. That's the whole idea. So the difference between limits concept is limit you're approaching, but derivative you are at that point. So you remember that part, okay? Now we'll begin with the very first rule, which is power rule, and this is the most powerful rule which we are going to use in derivatives. So what I have done here to begin with, I've actually derived the formula from the first principle. So we'll actually differentiate the function f of x equals to x to the power of n. Now if you have done binomial theorem, then you can actually expand the term uh, x plus h to the power of n and then derive it. Uh, <clears throat> now, if I want to find derivative for the function f of x equals to x to the power of n, then using the formula f dash a is equal to limit of this particular function fx minus fa over x minus a when x approaches a, right? So the x minus a approaches zero, very, very small amount. Now our function is x to the power of n, so I replaced x, f of x with x to the power of n, f of a with a to the power of n, divide by x minus a, x approaches a. 
Now, without going into how do I get this expansion here, x to the power of n minus a to the power of n is actually written in the factored form right there. You can verify this formula by expanding it. When you expand, you will see x times, uh, let me just uh, use another thing. When you multiply with x, then x times x to the power of n minus 1 will give you x to the power of n, correct? And when you do x times the next term, then the power will be x n minus 1, right? And when you multiply second time with a, x to the a times x to the power n minus 1, these two terms will cancel. You see that? When you expand, you'll find that. So all the terms in between will get cancelled. Only what remains is x times x to the power of n and a times a to the power of n minus 1. And you get what this is. Is that clear to you? Yeah. So this factored form is the correct form. You could verify expanding and simplifying it. Now, once we get this factored form, in that case, we can cancel out the numerator and the denominator factors, which is x minus a, right? So once you cancel x minus a, now you can substitute x equals to a, right? And then get your formulas. All the terms will be a to the power of n minus 1, a to the power of n minus 1, and we'll have n number of terms. There are n number of terms which are left. So it is n times a to the power of n minus 1. And therefore, we get our formula, which is the derivative of f of x for this particular function x to the power of n is n times x to the power of n minus 1. Perfect. Now, I would like you to actually go through this uh, method of proving power rule on your own. You should do it on your notebook, understand the whole thing. But it's very important and critical at this moment to understand the rule itself. Take it as a formula. If you have a function which is f of x equals to x to the power of n, in that case, the derivative is going to be multiplied by n and x power reduces by 1. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So we are going to use this particular rule now onwards to find the derivative at any particular point or derivative of the function rather than the first principle. However, remember, in your test paper, there could be questions which will specifically say find the derivative using the first principle. In that case, you have to apply the difference quotient formula and do just as we did for the cubic function right in the beginning. You understand? Yes. Yeah. And you may have to verify the slope of the tangent line so this tangent line which I've drawn here, you have to draw like this, form a triangle, and then verify that the slope is exactly the same as you got in your calculations. Perfect? So that could be a part of your question. Okay? So now, we have already derived the power rule. You can make a, a note of this. And with this power rule, I would like you to now tell me the derivatives of these three parent functions. I've taken very simple parent functions to begin with. Now the question is, find gradient function using power rule if f of x equals to x to the power of n, f prime x is n times x to the power of n minus 1. So that is the power rule. So we have to use this particular definition or the rule and find the gradient. So when you say find gradient at x equals to 1, first find the derivative and then substitute. To illustrate, I have solved question number 2 for you. So if the function f of x is square root of x, in that case, it is a good practice to write square root of x as x to the power of half. Perfect? Mm -hmm. Then the derivative f dash x will be bring half down right? and x to the power of half minus 1. That is the formula. n times x to the power of n minus 1. So n in this case is half, half times x to the power of half minus 1. So you get simplified form, x to the power of minus half. Minus half means it should be written in the denominator. So there you go. So that is your derivative. Is that clear to you? Yeah. 
So that is how you define derivative of the questions given in question number one and in question number three. Can you now, leave it as the um, half x minus half in that form? Yes. Okay. In this case, leave it like this. Okay. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> that sometimes uh, could be objectionable. But most of the time in derivatives, you know, whenever you have square root, it will come in the denominator. So we kind of leave it most of the time. Okay. Okay. But I, I like you to check with your teacher also on this part, right? I have no objections. And normally I've seen in test papers, it is okay. All right. So at in this particular point, right? Uh, but as you know, we should not leave radicals in the denominator like this. We have to rationalize. Mm. So check with your teacher on that part, right? kind of critical to check since uh, in test papers sometimes time is so critical that uh, every time making this change may take a lot of your time okay yeah it may not be worthwhile so sometimes getting a hit of 0.5 is better than trying to be perfect so i see it the other way right you understand yeah when derivatives uh, i i will uh, accept this kind of an answer okay now part b is find the gradient x at x equals to 1. So just substitute x equals to 1 and you get the answer as half. You get the idea? Mm. And then the third part is verify your result drawing a tangent line. So I've done that also. Here is my tangent line. And if I just make a triangle from here to there, right? So we know this rise over run is actually half. Correct? So there is rise of 1 and run of 2 units here. Minus 1 to plus 1. And therefore, the slope of the tangent line is half. So mm. that is the exercise which you have to do for the other two functions. That should not be difficult. Correct? Now, let's take up the next example. We'll build on our rule, which we developed, which was called the power rule. Now we are also doing derivative of a constant times the function. So now we'll again derive another rule. Derivative of a constant times the function so let us say that the function f of x is equals to k times, k is a constant, another function g of x. Using the first principle, we'll find derivative. All the rules have been developed by using the first principle. So you go through this exercise and land up with the formula. Then you know this is the formula. So next time, apply the formula directly. Perfect. So if I have this particular function, k times g of x, applying this difference quotient, we know k is a constant. It can be taken outside as a common factor. Inside what you get is g dash x. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. so, so the derivative of a constant time of function is constant times the derivative of the function. Uh, is that clear to you? Yeah. Now, it's important at this stage. Because we learned that if we have x to the power of n, then the derivative is n times x to the power of n. But if I multiply that polynomial term with constant k, then there is not much change. I have to only add k, multiply by k. Do you get the idea? Yeah. So with that, we have written a general power rule. General power rule is that the coefficient remains as the coefficient. Do you get the idea now? Mm -hmm. So that means that we can now find the derivative of any polynomial term very easily. Now, following this, we have two more rules which are called sum rule and the difference. Very useful, simple, and make a lot of sense. If you have two functions, if we add them and find the derivative, then it is same as sum of their derivatives. So either you add the functions and then find the derivative, or you find the derivative and add the derivatives, you get the same result. Perfect. Do you understand this point? Yeah. Means that if I have a polynomial which has many terms, I could actually find the derivative of each term and add it. Oh. Right? So that helps yeah. us to actually find derivative of any equation which is of the kind of a polynomial. Is that clear to you? Yeah. Now, one more important thing is that the binomial formula is a very useful formula. Normally, that formula is defined for n, where n is a non-negative integer. 
right? When we yes. learned about Pascal's triangle and all, yeah, it was one, two, three, four, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there is a very special case we call it McLogan series, where if we are saying a plus b or we are saying x plus h, in our case h is very very small. If yeah. the term h is very very small, then that formula works for all real numbers. So n could be um, any real number. Is that clear? Yeah. In calculus, it works for all real numbers because always we have the term h, which is very very small. Oh, um, okay. And yeah. the formula works for every 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 function because of this reason. So be careful. This is a very good note. You need to understand. Uh, so let me uh, stop sharing and discuss with you at this stage, Emmy. The most important point here is. We derive the formula using binomial theorem, right? Where yes. n is defined as non-negative integer. But a plus b, if b is very small as compared to 1, then that formula also works for n being a real number. It could be minus 1, minus 2, it could be half, it could be 3 over 2, whatever. Right? All right. Series, also known as McLaughlin series. Right? Since we are not there at McLaughlin series, we'll just use the formula, right? And the yeah. answer, and that is how you know we just had a factored form, we didn't derive it. And now we are saying n could be any real number. That makes sense. So not only polynomials derivative we can find, but we can find yeah. derivative of any function. Uh, okay. So let's go back to our screen now. And, and you know that could be a question. Sometimes they will give you, and I've seen it many times for GCSC level A. Oh. Yeah, they will write like this 10 plus 5 to the power of n, and they are using the derivative and finding the answer. And this, this doesn't match with the correct answer. What is the reason? Because the number 5 is not very, very small. That's the reason. Oh. Correct? Yeah. You factor out that some coefficient, make that 5 very, very small. You get my point? All right, okay. You then use the derivative formula, and whatever you factor oh, yeah. out, it has to be multiplied by that term. Oh, yeah. Don't forget that part. This, this is excellent question, which is always there. Sometimes students really struggle to understand because by the time we complete this course, you'll forget that from where we started with n, it was a non negative integer. Yeah. We started using it as a real number. Why? Um, because of h, which was very, very small, okay? If that is not small, we cannot use it. Remember that, okay? Yeah. Okay, now, let's continue with our screen. Let me share that again with you. There we go. Share. Right, so, so you understand now that we have a power rule, we have a constant rule, we have sum and difference rule, and that makes our life very simple. Now we can have derivative of almost all the functions, right? Yeah. Let's we'll see how to work with trigonometric and logarithmic and exponential functions later on. Uh, but at present, we know how to do it with other functions. So here I have taken a few examples for you. Question number two is the equation of tangent line. Most of the time, I mean, we are only finding equation of tangent, equation of normals, then when you have an equation of a tangent, let's consider this graph, which is graph of x square uh, cube root, x to the power of 2 over 3. Let me read the question first. It says, determine the equation of tangent line at t, 1, 3, on the curve f of x equals to 3 times x to the power of 2 over 3. Now, we can use the power rule straight away. We have the function here. So first thing is always write in the index form x to the power of 2 over 3 so that you can bring this 2 over 3 right there, right? The constant mm -hmm. 3 will remain as a constant, correct? Okay. And then to the yeah. power, take away 1, 2 over 3 minus 1. You get your answer. And that is the derivative, which is this particular expression. Perfect. Then mm -hmm. we want at point x equals to 1, substitute 1 here, so you have a 2 as the derivative at 1. That means the rate of change of the slope at this particular point for the tangent is 2. Once you know the point slope, 
and the point you can use the equation which is you know point form of equation y minus y1 equals to m times x minus x1 and there you go you get the equation of the tangent line you see how simple it is now yeah it's quite straightforward now let me ask two more questions based on this this is your tangent line your test question mm -hmm. could be find equation of the normal at this point so that could be the normal correct for normal yeah. we have to only flip this negative reciprocal of the slope we'll get normal so you perpendicular read question number four for me Amy. that is question for you so determine the equation of normal at p find x intercepts of the normal and the tangent Find area of the triangle PQR where Q and R are the x intercepts. Perfect. So these, these are my points. Let's say P, I'm just saying uh, uh, point P is here, right? PQR. Let me write down it. PQR. Is it okay? So somewhere we'll have an x intercept. Is that clear to you? All right. Yeah. And there you have a triangle. You have to find area of the triangle. So this length is the base and that is your height, 3. Oh. Half base into height, you get your area of this triangle. Very popular question. Always seen in GCSC test papers, level one. Absolute necessity to solve. So that is the question which you have to tackle. And you're Wait, so on your own, okay? Do they not give? So they don't give that normal or anything. We would have to draw it. Yeah, you have to draw it. They oh, might okay. give you graph at times. They might, yeah, they'll give you the graph. They'll give you the graph. Yeah. Oh, I meant the graph. I just meant that line. No, you have to draw that. Yeah, okay. But, you know, calculate it. So when you get the equation y equals to 2x minus 1, you can find that the x-intercept is when y equals to 0. Substitute 0 for y, and you get x equals to minus half, which is this. Is that clear to you? Yeah. So get the equation okay. of normal, get the equation of tangent, find your points, and then you know the difference between these two is the base, and height is directly given by the y value of the point our base into height. I've provided you the solutions answer, right? So check mm -hmm. with your solution all these answers. Okay. Now we're almost running out of time. So uh, let's go through a few more examples. Question number two here is equation of tangent line again. Now this is a second type of question. Find the points on the curve f of x equals to minus x cubed plus 3x squared minus 2 where the tangent is horizontal. Horizontal means, what is the gradient here? Zero. Zero, perfect. So just write the derivative, which will be 3 times x squared. 3 times 2 is 6, 6x. Six oh. equate, yeah, equate f dash x to 0, solve for x. We get two values, x equals to 0 and 2. So you get both the answers. So these are the values of x equals to 0 and 2, where you have horizontal tangent. And you know, these are also turning points. Get the idea? That's really cool, yeah. Good. Question number five. Read it. This is for you again. A fine equation of the normal at x equals one on the curve of f of x. Correct. I like you to take a picture of this page and also the previous page with your cell phone. And that will be your homework. Okay. So there are actually uh, 10 questions for you. Got it. Got it. The next page is right there. So take this picture. Mm -hmm. And the very first page also take this picture. Yep. Okay, great. So now I've taken a practical example on rate of change. Can you read the question for me, Amy? Yeah. Um, a spherical balloon is fill, is being filled with air. What is the rate of change of the radius of the balloon when the area is changing at a rate of 80 pi centimeter squared per centimeter? So this time the gradient is given to us. The derivative is given to us. We need to find what the radius is going to be. Now we always say yeah. that by dx, but the you know, functional name could be different. Here the function name is area. So we'll write a and r is our independent variable r. And you know the formula is 4 pi r squared. So we'll begin with the, the function which is a r equals to 4 pi r squared. Derivative, we'll use the power rule combined with the constant rule. So 2 times 4 is 8. So we get 8 pi r. 2 minus 1 is 1. Do you get it? There we go. We have the derivative, 8 pi r. I thought pi was a constant. 
Yeah, so pi remains as pi. 2 times 4 is 8, 8 pi. Got it? Oh, would it not be? Oh, I thought it would be like 0 or something. No, 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 no. It, it is a constant. 8 and pi is a constant. So you will multiply by the constant. R squared oh. derivative is 2R. So 8 pi times 2, I mean 4 pi oh. times 2 is 8 pi and R. And now you are given that the gradient actually is 80 pi. So you equate 80 pi with 8 pi and you get oh. R as 10 centimeters. Done. Okay. Take a picture of this page and read question number 6. Um, find the rate of change of volume of the balloon when the radius is changing at the rate of 80 pi centimeter squared per centimeter. Got it. This is the question you have to do. Take a picture and then we'll get to the last question. Mm -hmm. The last question here is your homework. So ah. take a picture of this also. You need to answer these questions and in our next meeting, we are going to discuss all these solutions. I'd like you to actually answer all these questions share with me what you have understood what you have not understood okay? okay and then from here we'll move forward to the next chapter and we'll discuss product rule quotient rule in the next chapter so we're done with the power rule and related rules now amy could you summarize what we have learned today yeah so yeah. uh to start off with uh derivative uh, we learned about so the so from the power rule, how do we get to that? So for most of the rules and things that we learned, we are forming it from the difference quotient formula, and we are always deriving it from that. So that's a really good thing to do because in exams and stuff, if let's say you forgot the power rule, the difference quotient formula is always going to be there for you um, yeah. as backup, even if it's longer, it's still always accurate. Um, so we got uh, the power rule f of x equals x to the power of n. So the derivative of that would be nx, um, where n minus 1. Good. And then if you had f of x ax to the n, it would be a time, the derivative of that would be a times n times x and n minus 1. Perfect. And it works uh, for everything. <laughs> so that's cool. And we have to take care of uh, tangents and normals in most of the cases. And we yes. need to practice with examples which involve both tangents and normals and the triangle form thereafter. So the third point could be the x-intercept. So most of the time what I've seen in your test papers is that you have to work with the y-intercepts, x-intercepts. You'll always get a triangle, find the area of that particular triangle. Sometimes yeah. we have to work backwards. We are given the rate of change. And we may be looking for the points which will give us that rate of change. That could be sometimes tricky. So with that, Amy, I think we can wind up today's session. Uh, mm -hmm. Try to do all those 10 questions which are there for you. And in our yes. next session, we'll actually review what you've learned. If there are any doubts, let me know. Also do all the questions from your exercise since I've seen most of the questions. This is the part, right? So oh, right. Okay. this is the major part for you. And in our next session, we'll learn about the product rule, the quotient rule, and then see how to work with those rules and do derivatives or more complicated functions, okay?